Kyle Bradish finally threw a bullpen this week. So what does that mean for his chances to return to the mound for the Orioles this season? We'll get to that and more coming up on this episode of the Locked On Orioles podcast. You are Locked On Orioles, your daily Baltimore Orioles podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey there, Orioles fans. Today is Friday, March 15th, 2024, and welcome back in to the Locked On Orioles podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. As always, I'm your host, Connor Newcomb, and coming up on today's episode, we are going to run through some Orioles news and notes from the week. We're going to recap the Orioles' two spring training games on Thursday, the regular game, and the very cool spring breakout game that the Orioles participated in on Thursday night. Then we'll get to some updates from the pitching side for the Orioles, new updates on John Means, on Kyle Bradish, and the landing spot for Dylan Cease and why he is not currently an Oriole. And finally, the Orioles, for kind of the first time this spring training, optioned a chunk of players down to minor league camp. We'll talk about which ones were surprising and what it means for the opening day roster. But that's all coming up on this episode of the Locked On Orioles podcast. Before we get to it, though, just want to thank you for making Locked On Orioles your first listen of the day. We are pretty much daily, five days a week, Monday through Friday, bringing you Orioles news, reaction analysis, everything you could want. Wherever you listen, give us a five-star rating and a review if you can, and make sure to like, comment, and subscribe to the Locked On Orioles YouTube channel. It helps out a bunch. We are less than two weeks away from opening day, and this is going to be a fun season on the field and a fun season on the podcast, so make sure you are tuned in to everything you need right here on the Locked on Orioles podcast. And on today's episode, let's start with the action on Thursday. The Orioles actually had two spring training games on Thursday. In the afternoon, they were in Bradenton to take on the Pirates, winning that Major League spring training game 5-2. to two. And then in the evening on Thursday night, it kicked off the spring breakout series that Major League Baseball has begun for the first time here in spring of 2024. And honestly, a very good idea for Major League Baseball. It's essentially games across the league featuring different teams where it's just your top prospects playing. There are no current big leaguers Nothing like that. It is all guys who have not made the majors yet, but are all showing up on prospect lists across the board. And it really gives teams and fans a chance to see all of their best young players in one place. And kind of the marquee game to kick things off was Orioles Pirates on Thursday night because it was the number one pick in the 2023 draft, Paul Skeens getting the start on the mound for the Pirates, and the number one pick in the 2022 draft, Jackson Holiday hitting second and playing shortstop for the Orioles. And it was a fun matchup. It's only a seven-inning Pirates won it through the one of the O's on Thursday. But I wanted to kind of run through what I saw from both of those games because we got really the double whammy on Thursday. Not only were both games, well, only one game was televised, but both games were at least on the radio or televised, and both games had the stat cast data as well. So pretty nice day of baseball. Let's start with the afternoon game with mostly the major leaguers and start with Jorge Mateo. He hit a ball for a single in that game, 109.5 miles per hour off the bat, his exit velocity. That for Mateo is the hardest ball he has hit since last May. We know how bad he was down the stretch last year. Great in April, average at best in May and horrendous the rest of the season. He hadn't hit a ball that hard since May. I know it's a spring training game, but that is at least a good sign for Jorge Mateo. And listen, I think we're all in agreement at this point. Jorge Mateo is making the Orioles opening day roster. He's going to be a shortstop against some lefties. He's going to play some center field. He's going to be a pinch runner and be a general utility man off the bench for the O's. If he can just provide them a little something with the bat, it's going to be great. And that is a good sign right there. Kyle Stowers. Well, he's done it again. Maybe been a quiet week or so for Kyle Stowers after he was the talk of Orioles spring training a couple weeks back. Well, he once again homered off a lefty. It was a three-run shot in the seventh that gave the Orioles a 5-2 to lead, ended up being the winning blow in this game. Now, all four home runs for Kyle Stowers this spring have been off of left-handed pitching. That's been the big question for Stowers. Can he limit the strikeouts, and can he hit lefties? Well, he's hitting lefties in spring, and this one was once again off a big league lefty, and that's been the other thing. All four homers 
have been off of major league left-handers. This one was off of Ryan Barucki, who used to be a reliever for the Blue Jays and now is a reliever in the Pirates bullpen and a guy who I'm pretty sure is going to be in the Pirates opening day bullpen, a legitimate major league pitcher. Three-run shot, 107.5 miles per hour off the bat. For some reason, even though StatCast was there, didn't record a distance on the homer, but it's still an uphill climb, certainly an uphill climb for Stowers to make this Orioles opening day roster, but he keeps mashing lefties. It's going to be a great sign for him. Craig Kimbrell came out of the Oriole bullpen and threw a scoreless inning, which results-wise was nice to see because he did give up four runs in his last spring training outing. Now, neither of those things are big things for spring training, especially when you are in your mid-30s and you've been around the game for almost 15 years and you are a future Hall of Fame closer. Kimbrell knows his body and knows how to build up to a season. Brandon Hyde said after the game he thought Kimbrell had more life on the fastball, which was a good sign. Now, the velocity was still down. He was like averaging 93 on his fastball. Kimbrell was averaging 96 last season with the Phillies, but it's a reliever. We're still two weeks away from opening day. He's still got time. And again, if there's anyone I'm going to trust to be ready for opening day on this team, it is Craig Kimbrell, who has done it time and time and time again. So nice to see him just continue to build up because start that year, he is going to be the Orioles closer and the Felix Bautista replacement. And the other big thing was Cedric Mullins, who returned to an Orioles spring training game for the first time in about a week or so. Mullins, who, who left the game with some right hamstring soreness, is now back in the Orioles lineup. Went 0 for 3. That's not really the point. The point is he's back out there. He's healthy. And all signs pointing to Mullins is going to be a full go ready for opening day. That is the good sign. Not going to be, at least at this point, any lingering injury for Cedric Mullins. But let's flip to the spring breakout game because... It was it was very cool to see. I think a fantastic idea for Major League Baseball. Like, get all these guys in one place, get eyes on them, broadcast it for free on MLB.com, which was a great call. Now, not as great to only have it be the hometown broadcast for the Pirates, and it was probably much better for Pirates fans, but for the Orioles fans, and in general, a lot of national baseball fans were tuned in at least to see Skeens versus Holiday, and we're probably there to see a lot else. And, you know, we're getting these awesome matchups, and they're you know, interviewing Andy Rodriguez, the Pirates catcher who sustained a, a major injury this offseason and might not even play this year. They're interviewing him in the booth. Now, when they had Tamar Johnson mic'd up, that was cool. And it was nice to have Jonathan Mayo in the booth. But they were, you know, they they went to an entire Paul Skeens interview that took like an entire inning. And he basically answered the same question 10 times in a row like that wasn't what you want to see. That's totally fine for a spring training broadcast. That's what we want. But when the Pirates knew, hey, our broadcast is going to be shown nationally to a lot of people, I would have hoped that Sportsnet Pittsburgh would have catered a little bit more to the national audience. Unfortunately, they didn't. So maybe something for Major League Baseball to think about moving forward. But I still think this entire concept, a, a major W for MLB. And yeah, Paul Skeens was sick, to be honest with you. Like the fastball is insane. He struck out Brad Field. He struck out Jackson Holiday, but we got to see Cade Povich throw for the Orioles. And and while Skeens only pitched one inning in this game, people got to see a lot more of Cade Povich, kind of what he can do on the mound as maybe the Orioles' top pitching prospect at this point. Povich went three innings, two runs, one earned on two hits, four Ks, and two walks. Only one hard hit ball against him. Set aside, these are only seven inning games, but there was not a lot of offense um, in these games. Only six hard hit balls between the two teams. And it kind of shows you there was only three runs or four runs, I should say, totally scored in this game. But Cade Povich was mixing all the stuff. He threw all five pitches, the four seamer, the cutter, the slider, the curveball, the changeup. He got nine whiffs, including five on the fastball. He was dropping things in for strikes. The velocity was good. He was 93 up to 95 from the left side. I like the pitch mix. He looks confident on the mound. He was painting the corners. It's been a really good spring for Kate Povich. He wasn't the only pitcher that shined, though. Speaking of shining, Trace Bright threw the other three innings for the Orioles in this game. I was a little surprised that the O's only used two pitchers in this one and used them each for three innings. Now, they're, they're both starters, so you want to keep built up. But what the Pirates did more so is had guys throw like one inning, and then they would have them throw more in the bullpen. But the Pirates ended up using six different pitchers in the seven innings just to showcase more arms. And the Pirates, just they have better pitching in their system than the Orioles do. So that may have been one of the reasons why. But Trace Bright looked awesome. And now Bright was facing more like lower level minor league hitters than Povich was Bright later in the game. But he went three innings, one run, three hits, four Ks, one walk for Trace Bright. Fifth rounder out of Auburn a couple of years ago, right-hander. 
throws hard, fastball was averaging 94. He was up above 96 with that four seamer. Curveball looked really good. Four whiffs on seven swings on that curveball. He had nine whiffs overall, but the pitch that just looked unbelievable to me was the changeup. Now, Statcast says that Bright only threw it five times out of his 43 pitches. He threw it more. I think Statcast might have misidentified that changeup as a cutter or a slider a couple of times. That thing was nasty. It was like 86, 84, 85, 86, getting a lot of swings and misses from righties and lefties. I mean, the curveball is good. The fastball is good. We know it. But that changeup that Bright was throwing that we know the Orioles have been working on with him since the moment they drafted him, that was a ridiculous pitch Trace Bright was throwing. He's most likely going to start the year in the Bay Sox rotation in double A, but we're going to see Trace Bright in triple A at some point this year. And he's one of those guys where the stuff is so good that the floor for him, I feel like, is a good middle reliever in the big leagues. And the ceiling is a lockdown starter. Very excited to see Trace Bright in 2024. And then just some of the other cool things from this game, like Luis Valdez came in and uh, he pinch ran in the second inning and immediately stole second, stole third, scored on a sack fly from Judd Fabian to score the only run for the Orioles. I don't know where Valdez's bat is going to take him, but he is the best base stealer and the fastest runner. Well, now that Enrique Bradfield's in the system, maybe it's a toss up between the two, but Valdez is just fun to, to run the bases. I mean, over the last two years, he's stolen something crazy, like 150 bases or something in the last two minor league seasons. He's just ridiculous to watch. He's a guy where if the Orioles, maybe this year, maybe next year, just feel like, okay, the bat's maybe never going to develop, which is certainly possible. He's kind of a little guy with no power. Come postseason 2025, the Orioles might just decide, let's add Luis Valdez to the playoff roster as a pinch runner, put him on the 40-man and just use him like a Terrence Gore type player. I, I mean, that could be in his future. He is that good and that fast on the base paths. It is fun to watch him just create runs. Speaking of Judd Fabian, who had the only RBI with a smoked sack fly to right center field. Fabian played left field in this game. He, he's a very good defensive center fielder. He can go get it and he can also throw. And the throw he made in the first inning, Cade Povich was a little shaky in the first inning, loaded the bases with no outs, but got out of it, gave up only one run and then kind of strolled a little bit in the next two innings. But on that sack fly that scored that one run in the first with the bases loaded, the runner from second tagged up and went to third, and Fabian made the catch in left field on a fly ball and fired a one-hop absolute cannon to third base, and it was a bang-bang play. Runner just barely got in there safely, but that arm from Fabian, he had a couple of amazing throws home to throw out runners in double-A buoy last year. He struggled a bit with the bat, and we know the strikeouts are an issue, but that defense is always going to be there, and that is going to carry him to the big leagues if nothing else does. He is fun to watch play defense. And then I just have an observation. Samuel Basayo DH'd and got one at bat, drew a walk in this game. And and Braylon Tavera got to to hit once and, and play some center field, made a couple of nice catches in center. Like obviously Basayo is bigger and, and better than Tavera, but those two guys are huge. They are built like legitimate baseball players, and they are young kids, 19, 20, 21 years old. Like it's going to be fun to watch. And we know about Basayo, but Tavera, too, one of the Orioles' big international signings over the past few years. Like It's going to be fun to watch those guys develop into their bodies and just see what they can do on a baseball field. It's just exciting prospect after exciting prospect in the Orioles' system. But back up to the Major League level, we go next because we got some pitching updates this week from the Orioles. I'm going to run down some of the big names coming up right after this. But first, uh, this episode of the Locked On Orioles podcast is brought to you by Robin Hood. And no, we're not talking about the character from the classic movie. But did you know that even if you have a 401k for retirement, you can still have an IRA? Robin Hood has the only IRA that gives you a 3% boost on every dollar you contribute when you subscribe to Robinhood Gold. But get this, now through April 30th, Robinhood is even boosting every single dollar you transfer in from other retirement accounts with a 3% match. That's right, no cap on the 3% match. Robinhood Gold gets you the most for your retirement thanks to their IRA with a 3% match. This offer is good through April 30th. Get started at Robinhood.com boost. Subscription fees apply. And now for some legal info, 
Claim as of quarter one, 2024, validated by Radius Global Market Research. Investing involves risk, including loss. Limitations apply to IRAs and 401ks. 3% match requires Robinhood Gold for one year from the date of first 3% match. Must keep Robinhood IRA for five years. The 3% matching on transfers is subject to specific terms and conditions. Robinhood IRA available to U.S. customers in good standing. Robinhood Financial LLC member SIPC is a registered broker dealer. And this episode of the Locked On Orioles podcast is also brought to you by FanDuel. Say goodbye to busted brackets because FanDuel lets you bet on every game of the tourney. Whether you're betting on a big upset or a one seed going down, it is time to go dancing on America's number one sports book. Right now, new customers get $200 in bonus bets if your first $5 bet wins. That's 200 bucks to use on point spreads, money lines, you can even pick who's going to win it all. I'm picking Tennessee to win it this year. So just visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and bet on college hoops all the way up until they cut down the nets. So we're here on an Orioles News and Notes Friday episode, and we got some pitching news this week. And let's start with the two main arms in the Orioles rotation who we know are going to miss opening day, but we don't know a lot beyond that. Well, we got a few more updates on John Means and Kyle Bradish this week. And let's start with Means. Orioles reporting that he continues to throw bullpens through another one this week, and he's not having pain. He's just kind of behind schedule. The Orioles, you know, holding him back a little bit longer. We haven't really still heard a timeline for John Means. All we know is that he's continuing the throwing program and that I think the other update was I don't think the Orioles don't think they're going to have him pitch in an actual spring training game. He's just going to continue to throw bullpens and throw on the backfields uh, down in Sarasota. My hope is we see means in May that that's pretty much my hope where I see it going right now. We probably don't see him in April and then sometime in May he's back on the mound. I just hope all is good. We shall see essentially with John means, but I think the more positive update was with Kyle Bradish and, you know, we multiple reports this week that, Radish threw his first bullpen since being shut down with that UCL sprain, the slight tear. He got the PRP injection. He started throwing from further and further distances. And for the first time on Wednesday, he threw off a mound this week. Now, it was 20 pitches, and they were all fastballs, and that's generally how it starts. You begin without throwing any breaking balls or off-speed stuff. You just throw fastballs. It was 20 of them. Bradish said he felt good afterwards, and he is looking forward to throwing another bullpen off a mound in the coming days. Now, he is not in the clear, but he feels his progress is going well. Everything is going to schedule. But this is another positive step for Kyle Bradish. Again, this doesn't mean he's going to be in a big league spring training game tomorrow and be ready in May. Like It's still going to take some time for Bradish to return to the Orioles, even if all is going well. But he's seeming positive, the Orioles seeming positive, that he's going to pitch for the O's at some point in 2024. I personally am still skeptical about all this. I still think... This is going to result in, at the very least, the internal brace surgery, which is like the lighter version of Tommy John and and quite possibly still Tommy John surgery for Kyle Bradish. But if you're going to go the PRP and the rest and the throwing program route, it's nice to see that so far, and they they found this injury back in January, we're here in mid-March, and at least at this point, it is working for Kyle Bradish. That doesn't mean it's going to work in the end, but it is working, and we will continue to follow those steps for the Orioles 2023 ace and the last pitching news is Dylan Cease he was a little surprisingly but was finally traded earlier this week traded on Wednesday night to the San Diego Padres in a prospect package of three prospects and then a a major league pitcher was sent over to the White Sox as well and you know we know the Orioles were in on Cease it seemed like the asking price was just way too high from the White Sox all offseason and then over the last couple of days you just heard more murmurs and Ken Rosenthal was writing about it and it felt like this trade is coming isn't it and it did and the reporting was the Rangers were in the Giants were in the Yankees were in we know the Orioles were in and the Reds were in and the Braves were in earlier this offseason well it ends up being the Padres and of course it is of course it's AJ Preller the Padres GM that makes this move because he's always the guy to make this move he trades away Juan Soto for a lot of pitching early this offseason then uses some of that pitching to turn around and trade for Dylan Cease with the two years of control. And, you know, I saw a lot of tweets and a lot of comments about, you know, oh, couldn't the Orioles have matched this? Couldn't they have done better than this? I honestly think what happened here is the Padres, or excuse me, the White Sox wanted one of two things. 
they either wanted a mega elite can't miss hitting prospect. And, you know, we don't know for sure if they truly did ask for Jackson holiday at the deadline last year, but you can assume the other players they probably asked for. So they either wanted that knockdown, no doubt hitting prospect, which we do know they were asking for Spencer Jones from the Yankees. Jones, a position player prospect who was ranked in the top 20 on the Fangraphs top 100 this offseason, one of the best prospects in all of baseball. And the Yankees have consistently said, we are not trading Spencer Jones. And that is probably where those talks end. So even with the Yankees needing pitching, and even more with this news recently that Garrett Cole has the elbow injury, and he's going to miss at least one or two months and, and might be getting Tommy John out of all of this, they still aren't budging on C, still didn't make the move. And then there's the reports that come out Thursday that the Yankees still aren't going to go sign Blake Snell. Not really sure what's going on with the Yankees, but I'm fine with them not having pitching. Totally okay with that. But Cease goes to the Padres because, again, it felt like the White Sox wanted one of two things, that high-level position player prospect like Jones, or they wanted really good top 100-level pitching prospects, and the Orioles did not have that. And even if you argue, okay, they had that before the Burns trade, right? They traded D.L. Hall to the Brewers in the Corbin Burns trade, but he was that type of prospect. Well, D.L. Hall at this point, and the Brewers still think he can be a starter, and he still could be a starter, Hall is kind of teetering to, okay, he's probably more of a shutdown reliever than a true starter in the big leagues at this point. He still could be a starter, but he's teetering towards that reliever thing. They got two pitching prospects in Drew Thorpe and Jairo Iriarte, I believe, is the pronunciation there. But two pitchers who are both ranked in the top 100 at fan graphs. And many people think, and... I honestly think might be true, have a higher ceiling than guys like Kate Povich or Chase McDermott in the Orioles system. That's just the case of this trade. Those are top 100 guys that the Orioles pitching prospects just aren't. Drew Thorpe, who might have the best changeup in all of minor league baseball, 50 future value guy, going to be in the big leagues this year. And Iriarte, also really high velocity fastball guy up towards 100, good slider, changeup with crazy movement. Also could be in the big leagues this year. 50 future value guy on fan graphs and a lot of this from the reports of Eric Loggenhagen over at fan graphs. They also got Samuel Zavala, a teenage center fielder who hits for a lot of contact. And then they got Steven Wilson, who is a legitimate big league reliever who had a 391 ERA and 53 innings of work out of the Padres bullpen last year and has four years of team control. That's valuable for the White Sox as well. They got four valuable pieces. And yes, in terms of straight up value, the Orioles have the prospects to be able to match that deal. But if the White Sox, which it seems like, wanted one of two things, either a top, top-level position player prospect, which means they would have wanted a deal that was centered around either Samuel Basayo or Kobe May, wasn't be Jackson Holiday, or they wanted this higher-level pitching that the Orioles just don't have. Chase McDermott, Kate Povich cannot match Iriarte or Thorpe. They just can't at this point in their prospect evaluation. So if it was going to be an Orioles trade, it was going to have to be Mayo or Basayo. And I can see where Mike Elias just said, no, we're not including Mayo or Basayo. We believe in them too much. We are not trading them away. And that is my assumption to why the Orioles did not get Dylan Cease. They pivoted and they went and got Corbin Burns. And you could say, hey, they still could have traded for Cease. I still would have loved that. But if that's what the White Sox were looking for, and that's what's kind of indicated with this deal and with the Spencer Jones ask from the Yankees, the reports we got there, it just it seems like wasn't going to happen because the Orioles just couldn't beat that deal pitching wise and didn't want to beat that deal hitting position player wise. I think that's why Cease is in a Padres and not an Orioles uniform. But one more thing to get to here on today's episode, We've got some players optioned to minor league camp. Orioles kind of finally this week starting to cut down big league camp and the opening day roster picture maybe got a little clearer, not by much, but we'll still talk about these guys who were sent down coming up next to finish off the pod. But first, this episode of the Locked On Orioles podcast is also brought to you by Amazon Fire TV. Fire TV is your destination for sports, from live games to highlights to in-depth analysis. Fire TV offers amazing viewing experiences with smart TVs as well as the Fire TV stick that you can plug into your existing TV that provides access to millions of movies, TV episodes, as well as free and live TV. So whether it's the opening weekend for baseball or the college basketball tournament, you're going to want to have Fire TV. And I think the best part about Fire TV is those Fire TV channels that includes all of us at Locked On and most of the big pro leagues and college conferences 
as well. You can watch March Madness, the NBA, MLB, and so much more. So check out Fire TV channels on Fire TV and Alexa devices. If you haven't checked out the Fire TV channels, you should. Trust me on this one. So to learn more, visit www.amazon.com slash locked on Fire TV. So we'll wrap things up on this Friday news and notes episode with uh, some players who were optioned to minor league camp. And I want to just run through the list here that got the Orioles camp down to 50 players in big league camp. That is still a lot. Remember, only 26 players make the opening day roster and go north with the O's to Baltimore to kick off the season March 28th opening day against the Angels. So 50 still a lot, but they've at least started to cut it down. It was in the 70s or the 60s at one point. They're at least starting to cut it down a little bit. The names that were announced, I believe, on Wednesday that were cut from Orioles camp, might have been Tuesday, they were not really surprising, at least some of them. Diego Castillo, infielder who the O's claimed on waivers earlier this offseason, outrighted him off the 40-man roster. He's going to be depth in AAA Norfolk. Errol Robinson has been a spark plug for the Orioles in spring training, signed into a minor league deal. He's going to be a guy who bounces between AA Bowie and AAA Norfolk and just plays some infield, plays some outfield. Gives guys a day off, fills in when a prospect is injured. He's going to be just nice depth to have as well. Daniel Johnson, the left-handed hitting outfielder of the O's, brought in on the deal. Also has had a good camp. Just is not going to be breaking with those other outfielders. He will also be, if he sticks around, a depth piece for the Orioles when they need it. And left-handed pitcher Luis Gonzalez, the reliever. Again, he'll just be a guy in Norfolk's bullpen this year. But then you get to four other pitchers who maybe at least had an outside shot of being on this opening day roster. Two of them are the Orioles' two top pitching prospects, Chase McDermott and Cade Povich, both optioned to minor league camp. There was maybe a scenario where they just wowed so much they would have made the team, but Brandon Hyde said pretty early in camp that those two were destined for the AAA rotation to start the year, but he hoped both of them could help the Orioles in the big leagues at some point in 2024, and that's what I see for both of them. Now, they could both make starts, but I definitely see McDermott helping the Orioles out of the bullpen in the second half, and it could be the same for Povich as well, and, and maybe they need them to be starting pitchers if you know Bradish and Means are out for even longer amounts of time for the Orioles. These could be their next two depth options in the rotation, but I believe in these guys eventually, but it was going to be an outside chance for them, even with the injuries, to make the opening day roster. But then there are two relief guys who I think, at least coming into camp, had a shot to break camp in the opening day bullpen. And those were the last two guys assigned to minor league camp, the left-hander Tucker Davidson and the right-hander Wanderson Charles. Now, Davidson came in on waivers this offseason, kind of an interesting piece, former starter with the Braves, turned reliever with the Angels and Royals. Good splitter from the left side, interesting stuff, just hadn't put it all together with the Orioles. They're hoping to, to kind of help him out in AAA Norfolk in the bullpen and help him find it. I think he'll pitch for the O's at some point this year. And then Wanda and Charles, who came in on the minor league deal last year, spent the year in Bowie, dominating, then had some struggles in Norfolk last year, but the O's saw enough with that 100-mile-per-hour fastball, that devastating kind of cutter-slider hybrid, to put it together. They brought him back on another minor league deal. He will start the year at the back end of the Norfolk Tides bullpen, but just like Davidson, I expect Wanda and Charles to pitch for the Orioles out of the pen at some point this year but it's not going to be on opening day. And honestly, even though Davidson and Charles at least had a shot, at this point, not surprising the two of them are kind of those first two relief options that go down to minor league camp and will not be on the opening day roster. But there is still, even if you think Dylan Tate and Mike Bauman are both locks, there are still multiple bullpen spots up for grabs and plenty of pitchers still fighting for those spots in Orioles camp with now less than two weeks remaining until opening day. And that roster bubble, the roster crunch, will have it all covered we come back next week on the pod. We'll be back on Monday recapping all the spring training action from the weekend. Next week is going to be a fun week on the podcast. We're going to take a closer look at the Orioles schedule month by month. Look to see where things can be easy, where things will be a little harder, what months they need to capitalize on if they want to win the AL East once again in 2024. And we'll just get you closer and closer to opening day with all the coverage next week on the pod starting on Monday when we return. But until then, I'm Connor Newcomb, and this has been the Locked On Orioles podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day.